start. Um, uh, so now um, we're going to look at something that uh, SimPy, uh, well, computer algebra systems in general like to um, brag about because they're typically very difficult to do by hand, and that's integrals. Um, so in general, the computer algebra systems are, are good for um, basically two things. Uh, one is uh, just bookkeeping, which is something that computers in general are good at. So keeping track of a thousand term expression without losing any minus signs, um, which is something that human beings are very bad at, but computers are very good at. And the other one is computing things that um, we might not even know how it works. It's just magic. And that's uh, kind of what the integrals module works. So this integrate function is uh, um, your main entry point. So I want to integrate x squared uh, with respect to x. So x squared dx. And uh, SimPy doesn't add the plus c, so if you really want that uh, in there, you've got to put it yourself. Um, but we get x cubed over 3. And uh, we can also do definite integrals, so from 0 to 3, uh, the same integral. Uh, and here we can see that uh, if we did this by hand, we would get x cubed over 3, evaluated at 3, and evaluated at 0, and we get 9. And the cool thing about um, symbolics is we can just go all the way with it. So anywhere where there's a number here, we can use a letter or a symbol. So I want to take the integral of x to the n, and I want to take that from x equals y to z. And here we see this, this here is a piecewise expression. So um, if n is equal to negative 1, then here this answer divides by zero, so it's not valid. We have to uh, we have to use a logarithm. Otherwise, it's this. Log here is um, as in most um, computer math systems. This is log base e. So this is the this is the natural log. <sighs> yes. <laughs> so how do computers solve integrals? Uh, it's magic. <laughs> So there are actually um, a lot of different algorithms used. Some of them very closely emulate what you learn in calculus. Some of them are completely different than what you learn in calculus. And uh, the more um, the more magical it is, the the more likely it is to be one of the ones that you didn't learn in calculus that uses some some more heavy mathematical machinery. But you can also do it just by the way you learn in calculus. Try to try to match some rules. In this case, um, we just know that when we're taking the integral of a power of anything, x to any power, that it's... Um, so let's... How do I insert a cell below? B. So, I mean, in this case, it just knows that x to any power, the integral of that, is this. This is basically just a table lookup for this integral. Um, when x, it's x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 when n is not equal to negative 1, and it's log x when it is equal to n, negative 1. Um, if we do something more complicated, like, uh, what's something more complicated? Well, the, the thing that I always like to do is take some crazy expression, like exp x times divided by so here's a crazy expression and just take the derivative of that so pretend that you didn't see this and you just have this let's simplify this actually just so it if you if you had this, how are, how are you uh, going to integrate it in calculus two or whatever? This is where we uh, um, this is where SimPy is doing things that are um, probably more difficult than what you know how to do. Um, 
And it also, oops. Um, so some exercises, here's some integrals. I'll uh, just compute them. And the next exercise um, is to try to break SymPy. So try to find something that SymPy can't integrate and see what happens there. Um, and report back because the no matter how smart you get with integration, you can always find something that it can't do. And there are always functions that don't have integrals. Or maybe you'll integrate something and you'll get some special functions that you've never seen before and you'll learn something new. Um, it doesn't do that, but if it does recognize it as an elliptic integral, it'll return the elliptic integral special function. So, so for example, um, there are several elliptic, uh, and I don't actually know what they are. Here's elliptic E. Right. So the answer is uh, no. SymPy doesn't try to doesn't have anything that does just classification. But um, what it if it can solve the integral and it gives you back an elliptic integral, then you know that if it gives you back one of these special functions like elliptic e or whatever, then you know that um, it's an elliptic integral because the answer is the special function in it. Uh huh. Well, when you try to find a uh, find find an example of breaks, yeah. I mean, maybe maybe it's like a handle example. It's probably you probably got something. Like that. So I don't know if this has any. Um. So we so we try to fi follow Python conventions for things that are like in the math module. That's why we use ACOS instead of ARCOS. That's not a whole lot of things. Beyond that, we follow just MP math conventions. MP math is the numeric uh, library written in Python that um, SymPy uses to do numerical evaluation. Um, the easiest, if you're looking for something, the easiest way is to just search the docs. So if you go to docs.sympy.org, and you should never rely on live internet during a, a tutorial. And I just searched for elliptic here. Well, we may have to come back to that because uh, we don't have good internet here. Is your question kind of like, if I get the expression back, is such a code symbol in it? Like, oh, if you, if you have the expression, then. Uh, yeah, I have, I have, I have you know, SymPy's results sitting in front of me, but I don't think I have those. Uh, what did you, what did you do? Yeah. Here we go. All right. So let's uh, 
Let's let A equals that. So we don't have to compute it each time. So uh, what we've been doing here is just putting like the answer in the IPython notebook, and that gives us this really nice LaTeX. Um, but we can also just print A, or we'll do stir A, and that'll give us a string representation. And the string representation is going to use the same name as how you would type it. So if I, if I just copy-paste this here, I'm going to get the same thing. Um, you have to be careful about the 1 over 2 stuff when you do that. But other than that, it's the same. And so if I want to know what is CI, now I know this is actually just spelled CI, and I can look that up now. Um, this is, again, this is better to look at in the SymPy docs because this is actually going to render as math. But, um, in fact, if this can load. Let's see if CI is on this page. Oh, there are a lot of CIs on this page. What is it called? Cosine integral. So here's what CI is. Uh, how is it cheating? So this 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 is a special function defined by the Euler gamma plus log x plus this or just this integral, and SymPy has figured out that. Right, your integral in, in terms of it is this. I mean, you can also say, okay, I know this is probably the integral of something. So what's the derivative of it? It's one over, it's cix is the integral of one over x times cosine x. What are the things that we can do with cx? Like, can we evaluate it? So what is ci of zero? This is, uh, this infinity with the little curly thing is uh, complex infinity. Um, if you've studied complex variables, uh, it's basically the, the infinity that represents any direction infinitely far away from the uh, the origin in the complex plane. Uh, what is CI? I don't know if this is a special. So CI of pi isn't anything. I can yes, I can. I can tell you what number it is using Uvalf here. And I can do uh, like series expansions and derivatives and integrals. I don't know if we know what the if we know what the integral of CI is. So here's the integral of CI. So even though it's a weird funky symbol on thing, it doesn't really stop us at all. Mm -hmm. right? it's so evaluated with the So SymPy has has tons of special functions, um, mostly so that when you integrate something, you can actually get an answer uh, because quite a lot of integrals uh, can only be expressed using special functions. And it's generally, uh, it's generally better if you have an integral to have some ex closed form expression, even if it's in terms of special functions. Um, for example, numerically evaluating a, a special function is far more efficient than trying to do some quadrature on an integral. So everybody done tutorials, finding, or it's not tutorials, exercises, um, finding the interesting integrals, yes? I'm sorry. Oh, right, so uh, infinity in, it, in SymPy is OO, and that's because it, it looks like a little infinity if you, if you squint here. So notice, notice how this looks kind of like this here. And that uh, this complex infinity is ZOO, um, which is uh, Z, Z is uh, the variable used in complex. Again, we could have, if we got something that had infinity, we could have printed it and would have, we would have seen it there too. Okay, and if, if, again, if you're getting bored, there are these calculus, advanced calculus uh, exercises, um, which you'll never be bored again. But these, some of these are actually kind of tricky, I think. Uh, they'll definitely keep you entertained. Some of them are also very easy. OK, 
Okay, any other questions? Any interesting results? Yes? Right. There, I mean, I don't think there is an integral for x to the x. I don't, um, as far as I know, if you, if, <laughs> I mean, you broke it. So here's an example here of what happens when we get x, a uh, function that we don't know how to do. We just get the integral back. So what, what, it, what actually is this? If I print this here. So we got integral with a capital I. So um, what this is here is uh, the capital version is the unevaluated version. So if I just want to create this integral without evaluating it, even if it's something that it could evaluate, I can use this capital I integral. And then later on, if I do want to evaluate it, I can call the uh, do it method, and that'll do it. Okay, uh, go on, meaning number four? All right. Okay. Okay, um, now we're going to use some, uh, some matrices. Um, so to make a matrix in SymPy, we have uh, this capital M matrix. And the convention is we have a nested list of lists, and each one of these lists represents a row of your matrix. So if you write it out like this, um, it corresponds exactly to uh, the matrix as you would see it uh, here. So here's a, uh, a rotation matrix. Um, and I want to know what the determinant of that is. Um, so that's rotation.det is for determinant. Uh, I want to know what the inverse of this is. And the uh, singular values. Uh, anything else? These are your materials, so I don't know if I should have said anything else there. Um, so now an exercise, find the in, uh, create this matrix and find the inverse of it. I want to reduce the. I want to increase resolution.
Okay, how are people doing? Matrices? How did the inverse look when you computed it? Did it look pretty? Did it look not pretty? A little messy? Okay. Okay, so let's, we'll get back to that messiness. Okay, so just like, so the SymPy matrix is kind of like the NumPy array. Uh, the sort of the standard operators you expect, uh, like uh, like broadcasting and scaling multiplication works with SymPy matrices. Uh, the star operator means matrix matrix multiply. Right, so here is rotating by the same degree twice. Um, we can make some vector, we can do matrix vector multiply. All the sort of mathematical operations you expect with matrices, again, sort of look and feel like you sort of want them to if you're acting interactively. Uh, so in last exercise, you made this matrix. Sorry, I'm switching to Mac for a second. The scrolling is uh, weird. Oh. There we go. Uh, so you, you then... All right, see up, on, up above, click show original. <laughs> 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 Wait, what language did it think it was? Y was in, so it's probably Spanish. Oh, okay. Comprendo. Okay. Um, okay, so you can do the inverse. It looks all sort of wonky, right? Um, and so we can ask the question, you know, so let's multiply M times M inverse. Okay, so we can use the star operator to do that. So here's the star operator we used to multiply matrices. So do the multiplication, and then see, see how, how it looks, see what works there. Um, so you get the thing that you expect out. So any matrix times this inverse should give you the identity matrix, the matrix 1, 0, 0, 1. So do we get that? Multiply M by its inverse. Yeah, that was not a positive yeah, that was a sort of yeah. What was wrong? Okay, so yeah, so he says yes, I got the identity, but I have to do algebra to make sure that it is actually the identity. So, but fortunately, you are holding on to a computer algebra system uh, where algebra is suddenly very cheap. Uh, so how can we do algebra to turn that, so you get out this, this ugly thing, right, m times n inv, we have this, this ugly thing, it's like, yeah, I have to do like some work to make that, to verify that. Uh, but so we want to sort of make this cleaner in some way, we want to sort of simplify this expression in some way. How could we, how could we simplify an expression using SymPy? We could simplify it, yes. So let's call the simplify function. Right, and so we get out our nice, our nice identity. So right, so we had this ugly thing, but turns out that when you have a computer algebra system with you, uh, things are no longer ugly. Um, okay, Aaron's gonna help me out with that. Okay. Um, so, yeah, question. Yes, yeah, so the question is why, why isn't simplification just always happen automatically? Uh, sometimes you don't want to simplify. Uh, this is actually like a, a point of contention within the community. Sometimes we want to, to write down an expression to have it just be that expression. We just want SymPy to have more or less activity um, based on our needs. Uh, some of us, we want to like write down an expression and have it be exactly the expression we wrote down. Sometimes we want it to be very, very happy. Uh, it does make sense that for a lot of users, we would want sort of maximum, um, maximum cleanliness. Uh, maybe that would be a, a, a sane default. Um, yeah, so Aaron's pointing out that simpl simplification can also be expensive in some cases. Depending on your expression, SymPy might try different algorithms that might be very costly. Yeah, so you're bringing up the point that maybe that's a tunable parameter you might be able to set. It'd be nice to say, you know, please give me all these things, give me only some of them. SymPy doesn't do that, that'd be a nice thing for us to work on in the future. Okay. Um, Mm. Right, so you're claiming that here, 
we're talking about here we're, we're stating that there is an inverse, even though we're not we're not confident that that this matrix actually does have an inverse. It may be the case that you know if x and y are both one, then this matrix is singular, and so it's sort of a lie that we're we're reverting this turning with this result. Um, uh, yeah, we're lying to you, but it's almost always the correct result. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm okay with it. Yeah. But no, it's a good it's a good point. Right. So he's so he's giving a good good example of why you might not want simplification to occur. Um, so we're the we're leaving it as a choice. Um, but for lots of users, that choice is, is obviously always simplified. So it's, it's a, um, so the community that uses SymPy is, is very broad. There's high school students who use SymPy. There's lots of people who do research that use SymPy. You know, it's, it's great for finite element computations. You want to have some, some polynomial, you want to compute derivatives of it, you want to generate some code. So those sort of users want total control over their, their work. High school users want, you know, maximum, maximum easiness. Um, and so it's weird hitting all of those communities at the same time. A tunable parameter like what you suggested sounds like a great idea. Okay, uh, so an exercise is, is compute the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of M. I haven't shown you how to do that, uh, but if you type in M and then dot and then tab, uh, IPython notebook might tell you how to do that. So it's a nice, nice occasion to just walk through the, the functions and methods that are available to you and see what's, what's around. So M dot tab, uh, gives me all these things. There's you know LUD compositions, there's QRD compositions, adjoints. Uh, we can make the matrix immutable, uh, various algorithms to compute determinants, eigenvalues, that might be interesting. Uh, characters polynomial, Cholesky composition. So lots of lots of different algorithms on matrices. Uh, as a warning, uh, symbolic so while numerical linear algebra is a very robust and powerful and relatively solved problem. Uh, symbolic linear algebra, the expressions tend to grow and blow up very quickly. So um, this works well for small matrices. It tends to tends to fail for very large ones. Uh, JSON actually is a good counterexample of that. JSON's work involves very large, very complex matrices. Uh, but if we type in eig, oh look, eig. Uh, yeah. So in this is just an IPython thing, uh, actually. So you can. Uh, so M and then dot. So as, as if I'm going to start typing some method, but I just press tab. So like in many systems, tab tell, asks for an autocomplete. Um, this is true in iPad the notebook, this is true in the terminal, this is true in lots of ways. Um, you know, so even if I had some you know, expert equals one, and I typed in you know, exp and I press tab, it would uh, give me all the things that start with exp. And you know, expert is in there. Here's expert. So, uh, autocomplete is a nice skill. Okay. So, there's lots of methods you can put them. Uh, so, we also support NumPy like access in the matrices. So, here's the zero zeroth element. Here's the first column. Uh, here's the second row. Uh, so if you're familiar with NumPy, these colons are convenient. They mean, you know, everything in that row, everything in that column. You know, that's for subsequence of our matrices using various slicing operations. Um, if you don't know that syntax, I recommend stopping the tutorial and going look at NumPy, which is very useful. Uh, and NumPy syntaxing is convenient. Is there a question? Right, so the question is, uh, when I do these operations on SymPy matrices, do I always get back SymPy matrices, or do I sometimes get back NumPy arrays? The answer is that you always get SymPy matrices. So NumPy is actually not a dependency of SymPy. Uh, we like, uh, SymPy is pure Python and self-contained. Uh, this makes it very easy to like distribute. Um, we have no ND array type in SymPy. Uh, we have actually like five different kinds of matrix types, uh, or like indexed systems. Um, indexed objects that do math in a symbolic way are like a strong topic that a lot of people in the community care about. 
a lot of us have built various things. So there's like, there's in the geometric way, there's like a manifold you can play with. Uh, there's a matrix like this. There's a, a, a matrix with arbitrary number of elements. There's an index type, which is used for writing down tensor computations. Um, someone has written a tensor type. Uh, we, have, we, as, we as a community have not really settled on one generic indexed for everybody type. Uh, it turns out that indexed like things are used by lots of communities in lots of different ways. And finding one, one ring to rule them all is, is quite challenging. Oh, is there an LMWise multiply in matrices? I wouldn't be surprised. Let's see if it's roach.lm and press tab. Nothing. Oh, Hadamard. There is a Hadamard. Yeah, so we can do Hadamard. I'm switching into matrix expressions here, which is something I care about, but... Oh. I need to call as mutable. Yeah, so that'll work. Um, so I'm actually hooking into another matrix system to do what you asked for, but Aaron was saying that wrote dot No. Come ask me later. I'll, I'll talk to you more about it. Okay. Um, matrices is empire the one mutable object that we accept, uh, just because it's mutation is so important to lots of matrix algorithms. Um, so we actually change elements. Um, so here we used to have a rotation matrix, then we've added one to it, and and we actually change the actual matrix rote. Uh, and so the determinant is now wonky. The singular values are now wonky. Uh, and so the last exercise is sort of play with M, try some, try some various things. You might, you know, check out the LU decomposition, um, or LU solve, or QR decomposition. So that's just something to play with. See what you find, play with it for a bit. I'm going to set up the next notebook, and we'll talk about code generation and how to actually get a NumPy-like thing out of your SynPy-like thing in a bit. I'm going to swap out. Code generation, code generation is my baby. That's all about it. Talk about code generation. Like what you fucking buy in piano afterwards. This is still like basic simply. I'm not gonna show the fancy things yet. Is that not a good idea or should I have all of it at once? Uh,
Any questions about matrices? Okay, uh, so I'll talk about numeric evaluation for a bit. Um, so SymPy is fun. Uh, it can again, it can handle lots of lots of problems in a nice way. Uh, oftentimes, the problems that we solve are just genuinely too complex to solve symbolically. And so the sort of intuition, intuition there is that you need to sort of switch away from symbolic methods, switch to numeric methods, and do all of your work numerically. Uh, and sort of a big shtick that I have, something that I, I appreciate, is the idea that symbolic methods are still useful in solving part of your problem, and then smoothly handing that problem off to a numeric system. Uh, so part of handing that off uh, is code generation. So if we have some symbolic, some symbolic problem, how do we how do we turn it into uh, into something that a numeric solver can can use? Um, actually, I have time for my so I, I often I'll, as part of my work I sometimes teach training courses, and when I do so, my, my introduction is always this: Hi, I'm Matt. Um, I care about I care about math. So here's a normal distribution. Here's a standard normal. I get the density of that. Uh, so my name is Matt. I care about um, I care about mathematics. I care about writing down things that are easy to use, getting math out of it, uh, and then I care about. Um, uh, turning that math into to numeric code, um, and so, so this. So I just want to point out that SymPy, we can think about things at a very high level. We can also think about things at a low level, and we, we give you conduits to switch from symbolics to numerics, sort of when you're ready. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about uh, for the next little section. Uh, people in the SciPy community tend to sort of like this uh, this topic because uh, it's sort of like, oh, I can use symbolics in my my matrix algebra code or in my you know, in my weather solver. Oh, how neat. Um, I, I used to do work with, with weather simulators, and there's an example in the WERF code, the weather research forecast code. It's, about, it's, it's eight or so lines of just dense numeric arithmetic, exponents, logs, powers, square roots. Huge, big, massive Fortran. Um, I was like, oh, that'd be really nice if that was in SymPy, right? We could just, like, we could simplify it. We could then emit more efficient code. We could, like, talk about this, this numeric code a lot better if it was in a symbolic form. Uh, and we could still, at the end of the day, we could generate Fortran code, right? Here, let's generate out Fortran code instead of C code. Uh, or let's generate out, you know, LaTeX code. Um, um, do we have a JavaScript code printer? How do I, how do I access that? Is that JS code? Yeah. JS, we got JavaScript. Yeah, look at that. Um, so you can, you can work in a, in a symbolic way for a while, um, and you can even, you know, uh, this might work. You can get, you know, you can do some interesting symbolic work. So here's the density of a normal distribution squared, uh, which is a chi-squared distribution, whatever. Uh, and we can print out JavaScript from that. So, so though, we've sort of been talking about all these things that symbolic systems can do for you. And now we're actually saying, hey, wait a minute. They can actually do things for you, the numeric, anal the numeric analyst, the person who runs with, with complex codes. Okay. So let's talk about how to do that. Uh, first, in a sort of simple way of just getting numbers out of one expression, and then in ways using NumPy, and then later on today I'll talk about other most sophisticated systems. So here's an expression sign. Uh, we've already seen subs. Subs is a very easy way to get a number out of an expression. Uh, subs, however, runs very, very slowly. Uh, if, we, if we time this, it takes, I think, milliseconds. Yeah, so about a millisecond to do this. Um, so that's, that's slow relative to what your computer would do if it just calls the sign operation. Okay. Um, uh, there's evalf. So if I have some expression, so I'm going to. Uh, so I've got some expression like pi. I can evalf. This is eval as a float. Uh, and I can I can do that in arbitrary precision. Okay. So if you for some reason you care about precision arithmetic, see if I can handle that for you. Uh, Things to note here are the subs method for substitute, which we've seen, and the eval f method. Um, what did we get? We got a little. Yeah? We, Senpai has lots of submarines. And eval f, no notification for that. Yeah. Um, and so we can, we can eval something as a float. So, two methods to think about. These are the, the quick, 
quick in terms of human time me mechanisms to get numbers out of expressions. Um, we've seen that we have this sort of interesting operations. Uh, so as a quick exercise, take the same result and get out uh, the, the value of this expression when these numbers are true, when n equals 2, when y equals 0, when z equals 3. So what does is, what is this n-gram come out to under these conditions? You can do that using subs and a dictionary. Once you've done that, there's another set of values. We run into this tricky uh, log case. And you'll have to use evalf to turn the result into a numeric result. This should be simple, but it's just nice to sort of exercise your fingers at typing in subs and typing in dot evalf. Does C code work on it piecewise? So when I plug these values in, again, I'm using a dictionary and this sort of symbol equals value syntax inside the dictionary. I get out the symbolic result, which again is like really nice we have a symbolic result. We can reason about our, our result in a mathematical high-level way. But if I just want a number, like is that greater than 5? I, I, I don't really know. Uh, we, can, uh, we can call eval f, and it gives us out a result. So eval f turns our symbolic thing into a float. When you actually want to leave the SymPy land and get back to Python floats. Uh, this is again kind of slow. Uh, so, is this using caching? This seems faster than I expected, to be honest. Might be cached. Uh, anyway, this is relatively slow. Don't use this in production, don't use this on a bunch of memories. Right. So what Aaron's saying is that you know this is this is fine to do for one set of numbers, but if you wanted to do this on say a million different number values for x, that would be maybe unwise. Uh, what would be wise is using something like NumPy. Uh, NumPy, if you're not familiar, is a great library for numeric uh, numeric combination in Python. It uses vectorized operations, gives you sort of the the syntax of Python at C speeds for lots of numbers. Um, for things like NumPy or things just like using straight Python, you have a function lambdaFy. So here I want to make a function that takes x into values like x squared. So lambda phi is such a function. Lambda phi specifies an input and an output expression. Both of these are SymPy expressions. And I get back out a function that gives actual computation. Uh, by default, uh, lambda phi relies on the math library. Is that right? Yeah, so by default, f is running at sort of Python speeds. So I've made an efficient Python function. It is as though I had written down um, uh, so same as def f of x return x squared. So it's, it's the same as though I had written a, a straight Python function. Okay, when I type, when I type in lambda phi. Uh, and again, these, these things can be, can be complex, right? If I have a sine of x squared, uh, that's fine. I'll start, I'll start relying on, on the Python math library. Okay. Um, but Python is kind of slow that we like to use NumPy. And so here, if you add another keyword, NumPy, we don't produce a Python function, we produce a, a NumPy function. We're sort of swapping out SymPy.sign for NumPy.sign and SymPy.pow for NumPy.pow. Uh, and so here, we've computed a function which takes NumPy arrays and gives you NumPy arrays back. 
So here's a quick and easy conduit out of SynPy into NumPy that you can use after you've done lots of computation. So we can take our big symbolic expressions. At the end of the day, when we're sort of ready to go back to numeric systems, ready to use a numeric solver, we can use NumPy to give that. We can use Lambda to give that to us. So as an, as an exercise, uh, we're given the radial wave function for hydrogen. I think this is carbon uh, at a certain, you know, I've been a while since I've taken chemistry. But here's a function, uh, and then compute a, make a function f that evaluates this expression with respect to x using the NumPy backend. So say f equals something. Uh, and then you should be able to plot your, the value of your function uh, using that plotlet. I think it's the top. It's the like, it's the density of, it's something like a probability density of where the electron lives. Yeah. It's not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's the case with lots of. If I knows all of physics, yes. <laughs> You're on deck, by the way, for whatever you want to do. Okay. Um, So again, we can use Lambdafy, and we give it the input we want to give it, the, the input variable, x, and the output expression we want, in this case, just this expert. We want to use NumPy. And then now we're just like, we're, we're outside of SymPy land, right? We're using NumPy, we're using matplotlib, and we're, this is just straight things that maybe you've seen before in other tutorials, and we can, we can plot out the, the radio wave function. So people in the break asked me, you know, I, I like I like to plot things. How do I plot things? Uh, you know, should I be using the SymPy plot, plotting mechanism? This is like, yes, SymPy plotting is great. Um, but if, if you want to, SymPy also just gives you hooks to like leave the SymPy world really easily and hook into the rest of the world as you like. Uh, so you can you can leave any time and use other more more dedicated tools for plotting. Um, so, but again, there's this function lambdafy. This is the easiest way to get your SymPy expression into the NumPy world. Uh, there are other mechanisms we'll talk about later uh, with Fortran code generation, with other systems that generate code. Um, let's just do this quickly. So we're gonna compute the derivative of expression for x. So here's the derivative of uh, this radio wave function. Um, Well, let's make an f prime lambda phi of x, well, x per dot diff x using numpy, and then let's plot uh, nx, f of nx, and let's plot, oh, I can't do this in a list. So 
So the muscles have used map pop them. Here we go. So here we have both the, the function as derivative. We use sympy to be the derivative, and we sent both of the expressions through numpy, through lambda phi to numpy land. So we have two functions that could be the function and its derivative uh, in different ways. Uh huh. Yeah. So what it means is that when I type, so if I had a, a function an expression like uh, x times you know sine of, of x, uh, it means that when I actually make my my function, um, I'm returning you know, x times np dot sine of x. Where if, if I hadn't done that, I would be using a you know, def of x. You return x times you know, math dot sine of x, something like this. Well, so if, if, you, if you don't use the numpy flag, you get the bottom one. If you do use the numpy flag, you get the top one. Yeah, so, so, the question, so the question now we're trying to figure out, we don't know, is what the current default is. There's a lot of developers on Senpai, someone might, might have switched it up. Um, it may be that for some simple operations, they can just like add two things, they use plus, and it works in both cases. Okay. Yeah, maybe it's just using the Python square operator, so it uses the standard Python dispatching mechanism. I don't know. It's not, I don't, it doesn't matter that much, I don't think. Um, um, okay, so... So this, so this concludes the sort of like basic all of SynPy at, at a basic level. Um, what we'd like to do now is we'd like to either keep going with some more advanced exercises or ask you guys sort of which modules you'd like to talk about. So SynPy has sort of a, a core, which we've just talked about, and also, also like, like a, a periphery, lots of different interesting modules. Um, so we have some things to prepare that we can talk about, uh, like statistics or more code generation. Uh, series expansions, there's lots of things we could talk about. Uh, people have requests, it'd be a good time to, to think about what you might be interested in. So it's be a good time to go to senpai.org and look at some of the modules that are available. And you might be wonder, hey, I'm really interested in series expansions, can you give me a quick five minute tutorial on that? Um, so you guys all have your own problem, you all came to this room with your own problems, right? And so Simpy can help you in some way. Uh, and so it, this is sort of also one of the more fun parts of this, this experience, I think. Um, uh, did you want to talk about PyDye at all? Sure. Okay. You want to come up and do it now? Yeah. So this is Jason Moore. Jason uh, runs a pro or helps run a project named PyDye, uh, which uses SynPy to do uh, mechanical simulations. It's wacky projects. Wacky project. Yeah. So I'm going to give a tutorial tomorrow morning. If this interests you, you know, you're welcome to come if you paid, I guess. Or uh, <laughs> so the key thing that I just wanted to show was um, Matt, Matthew just showed you a few things. He showed you um, matrices. And he also showed code generation. So we use a lot of uh, we use a lot of pieces of SymPy. Mainly, um, we use some calculus. We use uh, matrices. We use code generation to piece all the uh, bring all the pieces of the puzzle together to try to simulate dynamical systems, <clears throat> like how does a ball bounce on the ground, or how does a car drive a new uh, road? How do robot arms man manipulate themselves and pick things up? And uh, most of those systems are governed by uh, Newton's second law, and that's a um, differential equation, second order differential equation, essentially F equals MA. And uh, we typically write by hand the, out the equations of motion. So if you ever if you remember back in physics class or you had um, anything more advanced, um, uh, like the swinging pendulum or a mass and spring uh, and how they... Uh, and how their uh, trajectories changed over time. Um, we're interested in those kind of systems. So what we've created um, 
is sort of it's, it's partly in SymPy, and then we have some other modules that are outside of SymPy that do a lot of the numerical work. Uh, but the fundamental piece is, is that we have there's a in the physics module there's there's a vector, right? So we can start to think about um, doing vector operations in 3D space. So <clears throat> you can create vectors by um, first creating a reference frame. And then I can specify a, a reference frame here with um, unit vectors that are associated with that ref reference frame. So here I have um, three scalars, C, D, and E, that are multiplied by the uh, three, ve three unit vectors associated with that ref reference frame. And you can create multiple vectors and then start, and start to add them, subtract them, do cross products, dot, dot products. Uh, a lot of, most things that you can think about in your, that you learned in vector calculus can scale vectors, right, and uh, negate them. There's uh, the dot products are useful. They can give you the angles between two vectors. Um, you can do projections. So I have a couple of vectors there, and I can calculate the dot product. There's the cross product, right, in 3D space. Does that for you. So we end up having this vector framework that we can start to help us uh, with creating the symbolic equations for dynamic systems. And um, I'm not going to go into all this in, in great detail if you have a specific question, but we basically can handle all kinds of 3D space vector operations and when you define vectors in lots of different reference frames that are oriented and translated with respect to each other and keep tra track of all this stuff. So. As Aaron mentioned earlier, that you know one of the good things is bookkeeping. So if you try to do these problems by hand, the problem that I did for my uh, dissertation work, the initial problem was 30 pages of of code of symbolic out, of code of algebra, right? That I would have to do by hand, and we're going to make mistakes, right? It's just impossible not to. So we have to use these uh, computer algebra systems to help us do that. So with that vector framework. <clears throat> It gives us this tool to bookkeep and basically come up with F equals MA. And all the documentation for the symbolic stuff is in the docs here for all the vector operations. And then we also have a mechanics module that um, classical mechanics that basically works with those vectors and then translates them into these second order differential equations that you need to then simulate the system. And at this point, once you get those, that, those equations, we use code generation to push that to uh, NumPy land or C land or Fortran land so that we can integrate the equations in motion and find and simulate these systems and find their motion and find out how they change with time. So just to close that, um, you end up, we have a little, uh, once we get the symbolic equations, uh, transfer them into numeric code that we can simulate and then we can start visualizing them. So this is just like a little disk that, that rolls on a plane and all that is fundamentally started with the code in SymPy and, uh, and we end up with, with 3D um, visualizations and I can change the parameters, make a bigger mass disk or, or a smaller radius and see how these things change. And uh, I also had one more example that I'll show. Yeah, that, that's the one, and actually, I meant, I meant to run that. Um, is this where I want to be? So just oh, yeah, sorry. I'm a postdoctoral research at Cleveland State University in Ohio, and um, we work on biomechanics. I study how people walk right now and how they control themselves and they balance. I use a lot of these tools to analyze that same problem and uh, work in power prosthetic design and, su and, and such. And um, so that's what I'm doing now, and I use all these tools. If, I, if my research was going better, I would have shown you a nice walking model <laughs> that was balancing, but uh, he's falling down at the moment. <laughs> and uh, so I'll show you one last 3D pendulum here. This will take just a second. So the, uh, as, as Matthew mentioned earlier, um, equations grow, and you had the question about why do, do we always want it in a simplified state? Well, if I try to simplify the, the equations that we generate, it might take months. Right? So we have 30, 30 pages of, hand, of equations, 
And uh, if we try to run sort of standard simplification algorithms on it, it just, it just doesn't happen. So the best thing that we can do is take that code, generate numerics, and just work with it directly in an unsimplified form. And uh, so it's taking, this is a, a three-body problem that's running right now. Um, and there's going to be a little output to the screen, but it fundamentally um, we're defined, I'm defining a conical pendulum that has three links. So a conical pendulum is just like a, one link, you can move in both directions. It has two angles that it defines it, and we can have we find all these vectors to locate its mass centers and such. And then um, <clears throat> I add two more of those links, right? So it gets three. The equations of motion of this are pretty hefty. See, it's taking it's taking a little while on my machine right here just to do the symbolics. And uh, and once we get the symbolics, um, it'll jump over, generate the numerical code, and then the simulation. I should have ran this before, so we're not standing here talking. But any questions before this pops up? How do you, uh, like, if this takes forever, how do you actually catch the Yeah, we we don't we don't have a good mechanism. Actually, um, that's something that needs to be we need to solve in SymPy because we have a lot of functions, SymPy functions in there. So now we're at the numeric uh, call right here. Um, so the symbolic thing. All the best I can do right now is write it to a text file and reload it. But it still takes a long time to reload it and rebuild the SymPy function because they're so long. So we need we need some kind of mechanism that would be a fast pickle, I don't know, or something of these things. Uh, oh yeah, the, the generated form. Yeah, that, that would be a good idea. Just it's, it's really, it is just a string representation. I guess to answer your question, we do do that already, right? When we generate code, um, if I don't use LambdaFy and do a, a real uh, C code generation, it's there in hard copy form. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so Aaron was curious. So when we generate these huge symbolic functions, I mean uh, expressions in SymPy, I don't want to have to regenerate them every time just like it did because I've already defined the system and I know it's correct. Uh, so I'd like to cache that. There, there should be a mechanism to store that so I don't have to recompute it. And, that, and I was discussing the answer about that, which is we don't have a perfect solution besides generating hard code. Yeah. Okay, so that one generated. So if I now come to our little viewer. So now I've got this conical pendulum, right? It's hanging in gravity, gravity points down. It's got three links. There's a, um, a mass at each blue dot, and then each rod is defined by a, a, a cylinder with mass and inertia. And then we start it off in some initial condition. And then when you play it, right, it take it does some odd motion that's uh, chaotic in this case. It's, it's sort of these kind of systems are typically hard to to predict. So this is sort of a real life uh, use of going from symbolics to numerics to, to try to analyze uh, a real system. And, um, and all that's sort of in SymPy and some, and some other modules called PyDi. We're going to teach you how to do this to tomorrow morning if you want to take, take SymPy a little further and see some of the adva advanced capabilities, which we've seen a lot of the pieces today uh, to put this together. Any questions on that? Correct. Yeah, so he asked if we, um, you know, what's the full process there? Do I symbol create the symbolic things, lambdify it, and then numerically integrate? And that's basically exactly right. Um, for the simple problems, we can use lambdify and, uh, and integrators in, uh, for example, in SciPy, in OD, uh, SciP, SciPy uh, integrate module. Um, for the real complex ones, though, I typically the lambda phi step is replaced with some of the C code or Fortran code generation so that we can get sort of really fast integration because it might take a long time to evaluate those at each time step. <coughs> Anything else? All right, so we'll open it up to um, general questions about what, what modules you guys are interested in learning a little extra about and we'll uh, do a sort of live tutorial.
Yes. So I'm actually not familiar with um, So you want to, you have some polynomial in SymPy, and you want to do that, you want to evaluate that with, um, let's make that a different number. Right. So SymPy has a whole module dedicated to doing polynomial manipulation. And your main entry point there is going to be this poly function. Um, and that's going to create uh, this polynomial object. So this is a polynomial in x um, over the integers. And uh, so if I make this. Yeah, so now we can take p.coefs, uh, I believe. Uh, of course, it's a method. And that will give you your coefficients. Um, is that, does that answer your question? Okay. Uh, there's, there's, a whole, there's a whole bunch of other stuff you can do. You can, you know, you can factor this. You can, it doesn't factor, but you can... So um, I don't necessarily recommend that this is the way that you should do it, but the way I do it is I grab the code base. <laughs> the question was, how do we find out what's in SymPy? Do we do we Google? Do we look at the docs? The docs are fairly complete. Um, uh, searching the docs or just searching Google um, should get you pretty close. Uh, we have a very great community, so as Jason suggested, if you ask on the mailing list, uh, you'll probably get a, a good answer. Um, I mean, if you, you um, it's like something Matthew suggested earlier, uh, the IPython tab completion is a great way to discover a bunch of functionality that something has in SymPy that you would never guess. Um, Another comment is that, in general, open source projects are very hard to find the right tools for them. And so it is harder. So I'm asking. SymPy has pretty good API documentation. So, like, if you have a function uh, and you, you look at its doc string, that's actually a very bad example. <laughs> uh, you're going to get good good doc tests. You're going to get some C also some some reference from Planet Math or something. Um, but our our um, uh, what would you call it? Our narrative documentation is not um, always as good everywhere. But the community is extremely friendly. You just show them that it's a problem. 
suggest probably Aaron will respond in like 30 minutes. <laughs> Is there anything else we want to? If not, I have. Um, uh, let's let's do series expansions. Um, that's that's a useful thing. Um, so the the main entry point for series, if I say I have some function like cosine x, um, I want to know the series expansion of that up to. Uh, with respect to x um, at the point zero uh, up to ten terms. And so we get this classic series expansion. Um, something to note here is this order term at the end. Uh, this thing is kind of uh, magical in that it automatically will eat anything that is of that order. So if I add x to the 12 here, um, that's of the order x to the 10 at 0, so um, that's going to give me the same thing back. So if I don't want this order term here, um, there's this remove o uh, function, and that'll, that'll just take that off. And so hmm, let me just run through Yeah, so this was initially an exercise, but um, I think it's instructive to just run through it. So here's a fun, a fun little um, application of series expansions. Um, we all know the Fibonacci sequence, uh, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8. You take the, the two previous terms and you add them together to get the next term. So 2 plus 3 is 5. 3 plus 5 is 8, 5 plus 8 is 13. Um, lots of cool things about this. One cool thing is if you take this function here, x over 1 minus x squared minus, 1 minus x minus x squared, and we take the series expansion of that. I did not want to do that. So let's, let's try that. So x over 1 minus x minus x squared. Take the series expansion of that. After we initialize our variables. That's another uh, gotcha I completely forgot about. Um, if you've ever worked with Maple or Mathematica, you can just type something like this and anything that's not defined will just automatically be a symbol. But since we're in Python, um, we have to define our variables before we use them. So that's why we always have these x, y, z equals symbols things here. Okay, and so uh, let's do let's do a few more terms. And so we can see here the coefficients, um, except for this first one, are oh no. Yeah, no, the first one, too. One, so we have 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34. And so now the, the problem is using this, uh, we, we want to write a function that gives us the Fibonacci numbers using this, this, um, this method. So a useful thing here is the COEF method. This will, COEF um, xn will give us the coefficient of x to the n. So the coefficient of x to the 0 is 1 here, the coefficient of x to the 1 is 2, and the coefficient of x squared is negative 1. So if I want to have, figure out what the Fibonacci sequence is, well, I've already, I already know it's this function here. I need to take a series expansion with respect to x at 0. I'm going to need terms at least up to this number that I'm computing at, so let's just do that. Take that many terms. Um, I should probably remove the O. It doesn't, it probably doesn't matter here, but it doesn't hurt. And then take the, the coefficient of x to the n. So let's see if that worked. 
Oh, we need to return it. Okay, so where what's the bug here? Do I need to do n plus? Um, yeah, that's actually that may be the point. Yeah. So um, I'm glad you spotted that because I. I was a little dumbfounded myself. But yeah, here, 10, 10 terms means this n here is actually the term that's in the order. So we don't actually know what the highest term will be before the order because this could be zero, um, like it was here, uh, like it was here. Um, this, I took this cosine series to 10, but my highest term was, was x to the 8 because the x to the 9th term is zero. So this is a very inefficient way to, to compute Fibonacci numbers. You can see it takes a little while. Uh, there's a much more efficient function called Fibonacci in SymPy that will compute 10 of them faster than it computed this one. Uh, how does what work? I don't know. It probably uses the... Um, Let's see. So this is the great thing about open source. We can do two question marks here. No, no, I mean, the series expansion is just a cool little math trick, right? We don't actually want to use that. Um, yeah, it just, um, it does some memoization and it just computes the... Uh, um, it just computes the previous term to the next previous term. This fib poly, you might be right. I'm not sure how this fib poly works. This is, so for example, um, factorial, I believe, uses some, uses this prime swing algorithm which is more efficient than just multiplying the first n integers uh, because you only have to multiply the prime numbers in a certain way. Um, but it's, it's a little more complicated than, than what you'll read in any programming tutorial that tells you how to recursively define factorial. Um, Okay, unless there are any questions or any requests or anything else. The alternative is uh, um, we can learn about SymPy statistics module, which I think is really cool. Um, obviously, Matthew thinks it's cool because he wrote it. Does that sound good? Let's do that. The yeah, Apanov. Um, I mean, like you define your. There's no the Apanov exponent like function, but you could define them. You look at some system. You look, at, you look at the Jacobian of that system, you could find, you know, eigenvalues of that Jacobian. Um, so we don't have like a, here's the Alpha exponent function, but you could describe that pretty easily with SymPy primitives. Um, but no, there's no, no one's come along and like written down nonlinear dynamics in a clever way. I mean, honestly, Jason's probably the closest person to, uh, to that sort of system, but not in the way that I think you're thinking of. Yeah. Um, but like you can like easily describe the Lorenz attractor and then like get out the you know Jacobian at any given point find exponents. We could do that now if you wanted to. So, so one of one of the benefits of of 
really thinking about SymPy as a library is that we, we really make it so that you can make your own user-defined functions and extend it. Um, so for example, you can take any uh, SymPy function you want and, and subclass it and define your own functionality on it or define your own function that has the same status in SymPy as the ones that come with SymPy. So it's really, um, if you have some concept that's not implemented in SymPy, but you know how it works mathematically, it's really straightforward in most cases to just write that down and it'll work with SymPy. Um, in your case, I think you should just like use SymPy matrices to define something uh, and then ask things at, at a slightly lower level, but still at a very high level mathematically. Uh, okay, so talk about SymPy stats for a little bit. After that, I'm gonna talk about code generation. Uh, two things that I care about, uh, but really, if you guys have questions, uh, you know, I'm really interested in open exponents. How would I do that? Uh, that's a great question. So thank you so much for for speaking up. Other people, you guys all work someplace, right? So you presumably need. You're here for some reason. You think that symbolics might have been cool a little bit for your work. So hearing about that would be interesting. Until then, people like statistics. I found uh, it seems to be a hot topic. Uh, so here I'm making a symbolic symbol. So x is just a, like a SymPy symbol, but it's imbued with a distribution. It happens to know the values that it might take on with various probabilities. And we can ask questions about x, like its density, so we get out a, a standard normal distribution. Okay. Uh, but what's sort of neat is that we can, we can treat uh, x uh, like a symbol, uh, and we can do you know, x you know, squared is you know, less than 1, and here's an here's a expression, SymPy expression, uh, and we can ask for you know probabilities where that's true, um, and so what this is actually doing under the hood is that it's taking so x again is like a symbol, so x um, we could have written x equals symbol like this, but we didn't. We said it was a normal just normal random variable, so x acts in every way like a symbol but it has extra information. And we get out that extra information when we use these operations like density or p. So here we're asking uh, where x squared is less than one. And we can actually see exactly what it's doing uh, by, by asking it not to evaluate itself. So here we see that it's actually just constructing an integral to compute. So if where x squared is less than one, it means that x is between minus one and one. And so we just want to compute the integral you know, of that bell curve between minus one and one. Okay. And so SymPy stats is a nice little way of writing down probabilistic systems and then transforming queries on those systems into deterministic SymPy expressions. Um, so you know, we can, we can that should have been down here. Yeah, we can do the density of x two times x, right? And you see that we get this other, you know, a slightly different density. Where sort of SymPy is handling all these manipulations. Turns out if you sort of look at a Stats 101 book, it's full of lots of annoying bookkeeping, but fairly straightforward bookkeeping. And so that's the sort of thing that SymPy can handle really well. So, uh, you know, because of this little Stats module, SymPy can do sort of Stats 101 homework pretty Pretty simply, uh, you know, we can we can sample, sort of sample function, yeah. sample x, uh, example x is greater than zero, etc. Uh, someone during a break, oh here's dice, okay, that I sell dice games. There's a probability that a squared is greater than b, you know, four over three. So these are sort of intended to look like what you would sort of write down uh, on math or how you think about it mathematically. Um, so, uh, so here we're making two dice. We have six sides. Maybe we like twenty-sided dice for some reason. You know, we might do something, something different. You know, we can sort of play with these things. Uh, someone during the break was asking about, uh, hey, does SymPy have like a cumulative normal distribution? What what distributions do you have? Um, and so here's like a gamma distribution. Um, here's the density of a gamma distribution squared. I have no idea what's, why you would care. Um, 
So you can you can write down sort of interesting complex systems uh, in SymPy, uh, but now you can write down those complex systems with some uncertainty uh, inserted in some of the variables, and you can ask interesting questions about, about the result. Um, I had a nice little kinematics example before I probably can't recreate easily. Um, but let's import SymPy.stats. Uh, but there's you know, various distributions you can play with. Uh, if nothing else, then just to get uh, you know, a catalog of special functions you might care about. Um, okay. So there's that. Let's talk about code generation for a minute. Unless people have questions on stats. We're trying to give you some depth. SymPy has this core. Well, so lots of people come on and sort of said, hey, I care about this topic, I care about this topic. Uh, we had a nice Google Summer of Code student come in this year and say, hey, I want to contribute field theory, quantum field theory. Uh, he didn't end up getting in, but there's sort of uh, various topics have been sort of specialized and gone out in depth. Uh, statistics is one of them. Uh, so SymPy stats is, again, sort of handle your stats 101 textbook pretty easily. Uh, which is a nice thing. Stats 101 problems actually do come up fairly often in practice. Um, okay, so here's code generation. We talked about Lambda file a little bit before. I also showed you uh, C code and F code to print out code. Uh, I want to talk about why you might use Lambda file or not use Lambda file, and sort of some other options that are out there. So here is our. Oh gosh, from physics, hydrogen. So here's a little expression. Uh, we're going to import lambdafy, and we're also import this function ufunkify. So people are familiar with numpy, the term ufunk might sound familiar. It's any function that sort of applies universally across a, a vector, normally how we use numpy. And so we're going to make uh, a function that evaluates this expression, just like how we did in the last section, uh, both by using lambdafy to create numpy functions, and by using ufunkify which produces Fortran code, then compiles that Fortran code, and hooks that Fortran code back up to NumPy. So one of, the, one of the unfortunate pieces about NumPy is that when you say x equals some NumPy array, and you say, let's say, 2 times x plus 1, it actually has to go through this operation. It does a little for loop. It walks over your array. It multiplies each thing by 2. Then it does this operation. It takes that array you just produced. It walks over it again and adds 1 to each element. And that's a little slow because you're walking over the array twice. Uh, you'd rather just walk over one, the array once, and on each element, multiply it by, by two, then add one. You'd have far, far less memory access. And so by, so because SymPy has this ability to generate Fortran code, we can skip that unfortunate piece. Um, so just to demonstrate, the two functions work just the same. So the Fortran code is the exact same thing as the NumPy code. We can plop them, see what they look like. Here we've got 50,000 numbers. We're plotting them those very fast. And let's time it. <coughs> we see the Fortran function is a little bit faster. And the speed increases quite a bit as you get to more and more complex expressions. As your work becomes more and more complex, the, this inability of NumPy to sort of fuse all of your operations in one operation becomes a bigger deal. Um, we'll talk about a more complex expression in a second. Uh, there's a project very much like SymPy called Theano, uh, which I, I recommend. Uh, uh, so Theano is sort of, sort of like SymPy in that it produces uh, these expressions as graphs rather than doing straight numerics. Uh, but it does less math and more code generation. Um, they also generate down to, they also generate like CUDA code, uh, if you care about that, which, which you may. Uh, so here, um, yeah, so here is sort of similar syntax to SymPy. Uh, we're creating some expression, uh, make two vectors. We multiply one of them by two, we add it to the other one. We got this thing, and this thing is just, uh, uh, just some symbolic object. Uh, Theano.printing.vlogprint. And so, just like how SymPy produces a tree, Theano produces a tree. Okay. Um, 
Piano is a little bit less pretty to work with, but it, it's more numeric. We can make a function. This is now generating C code. It's compiling that C code. It's hooking that C code back up to Python with native uh, NumPy wrappers around it. Uh, and so uh, here we're sort of testing that function against some basic NumPy arrays. So here's a function we created with Theano. It takes NumPy arrays, produces NumPy arrays. Okay. Okay. Uh, so SynPy and Theano have this really nice connection between them. This was joint work with uh, Frederic Bastien uh, at Theano. So if you have any SynPy object, like this A, uh, SynPy has, just like it has a, a C code printer and a Fortran code printer and now a JavaScript code printer, it also has a Theano code printer. So we can turn our SynPy objects into, uh, into Theano objects, where this thing is now of type uh, Theano variable. So any SynPy variable, you can do mathematical stuff with it, you can then ship it over to Theano. You can do Theano stuff with it, and you can ship it over to C. Or uh, so this expression was our, our big uh, radial wave function. In Theano, it looks like this. Um, we can make a function out of it. Uh, Theano will actually do some, oh, I already have it down there. Uh, Theano will do some nice optimization. So it, it, it says, oh, these are all element-wise operations. Uh, let's just combine that into one scalar operation. And we'll just run that over all of our inputs at once. So Theano's doing lots of loop fusion here, uh, and it works just the same. Okay. Uh, to be more fun, let's also compute the derivative simultaneously. We've got our expression, we've got our expression taking the derivative of it. Uh, let's compute all these functions that compute the same pair of expressions in two different ways. They use lambdaFy. Uh, they generate Fortran code, or they use Theano. But now we're, we're computing two outputs simultaneously. Uh, two outputs look kind of like that. So again, there's our function and the root of the function. We can time them all. So NumPy is okay, Fortran is a little bit faster. The Theano solution comes in about half the speed. And that's because it's able to do, uh, there's a lot of shared structure in our two outputs. Like this exponent here is the same between the two. Theano is able to take advantage of common sub-expressions in a way that the other products aren't. So uh, this is sort of, again, more fancy code generation. Um, there's lots of projects that are out there that do code generation. Code generation is like a big topic. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, you can make computers think about things and have them write code rather than you writing code in restricted contexts. Um, SynPy also has a, a more sort of general matrix object that can handle matrices of arbitrary size. Uh, and so the Theano system can handle that too. Um, so I think inside of F, uh, right, so here we've made a, a matrix symbol to SynPy object that represents a matrix of sort of without specifying the entries explicitly. We've computed uh, a function that takes x and y and produces x times y, uh, and that turns into a dot twenty two. Uh, Theano will like link against BLOSS. If I had a GPU on my machine, it would have sent the the matrix down to the GPU and used you know CUDA BLOSS to handle that. So there are lots of fun things uh, with SynPy and with Theano. I can write code that's faster than people in this room. Uh, my guess, unless you're you're very good, um, from a very high level platform. So okay. that's my shtick on code generation. Yeah, so Theano is not part of SynPy. Theano is a separate project. They're based out of a lab in Montreal. Uh, they're like a machine learning lab that like had lots of people who needed to write CUDA code. And they said, oh, that's hard to do. We'll help with that. OK, yeah, so Theano, Theano is also difficult to install sometimes. Uh, their documentation is good, but it does require some, some effort. Um, so Aaron just said it doesn't come with Anaconda. So you don't have it right now. You actually have to do some work to get it. What is the best way to get matrices to solve on CUDA? You could write. Yeah, so
So the question was, how do I solve ma matrices numerically on CUDA if I don't know how that works? And so first of all, this is the SymPy tutorial, but that's like the furthest question you could ask for from the SymPy tutorial. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. So last time I checked, Theano does not handle matrix solves on CUDA. They should, they're talking about it. Uh, if that was the case, I would say check out Theano. Um, I highlight a dissertation you could look at, but that's not the easiest way. Um, My guess is that right now, you could write some CUDA. That's that's my guess. I don't know of a system that makes. Well, you could you could you could use CUDA Bloss. Uh, there's projects like Magma uh, that I would that would use your GPO uh, opportunistically. Um, Numba, an option. Numba probably doesn't have a matrix solve operation. So there's a project called Numba, which takes Python functions and jits them down to CUDA code. Uh, but I think I want to top, stop this conversation unless, yeah. Pyvia. Oh, Py Pyvienna, yeah. That, that, that could be relevant, yes. So Py Pyvienna is a talk on Tuesday. Uh, Vienna is like a C++ project, I think, that handles some interaction with GPU stuff, I think. Uh, and PyVienna is a link to that. Sorry? No, I mean, so the goal of, I mean, part of my interest in SymPy is that it lets novice users write code at a high level that then gets compiled down to the right code you should have written before. Projects like SymPy help that with that. Projects like Vienna help with that. I think that's a topic of interest to the SciPy community. Um, um, we're not there perfectly. It's a very hard problem to do in general. Um, so I don't know any project that does what you're talking about explicitly. I would not be surprised to find that there are things that I don't know about that exist. Um, but yeah, Pyviana might be one of them. Talk on Tuesday. I think check out. What are people's interests? Someone to shout out. Everyone will be very happy if you just say like, hey, I'm really interested in matrices. You talk more about matrices. Or I'm really interested in um, more of the PyDi stuff. Let's take a 10-minute break. Uh, let's come back at 4.40. We'll have 20 minutes to play around with things. Let's come back at 4.40.